The world is full of bad actors. I'm talking states and international groups here, not the likes of Vin Diesel. Bad actors like orchestrating diversions, or at least thinking about how to make the most of any crisis that comes along, better to enable them to get on with whatever they're up to without being observed. I've said before I don't think Russia is behind the current outbreak of fighting in Israel and Gaza, but like any bad actor, Vladimir Putin has taken full advantage of the world's attention being drawn away from his ongoing criminality in Ukraine. Look at the brewing crisis on the Venezuela-Guyana border, however, and I wouldn't be so sure Russia can claim to be just an interested third party. On Sunday, December the 3rd, Venezuela held a referendum over what it says are its rights to a potentially oil-rich territory that is the subject of a border dispute with neighbouring Guyana. The region, called Essequibo, and which makes up two-thirds of Guyana, is mostly rainforest above ground, but is thought to be rich in fossil fuels below. Plus, in 2015, a potentially massive oil field was discovered just off the coast. The area has long been a source of friction between Venezuela and Guyana, which gained independence from Britain in 1966 and is still a member of the Commonwealth. An 1889 ruling that said that Essequibo region was part of Guyana has periodically but repeatedly, depending on the political mood of the time, been dismissed by authorities in Venezuela's capital, Caracas. Continuing a long trope of blaming anything bad on the United States, Venezuelan politicians seeking to thump this particular tub dismiss the 1889 ruling as their country had been represented in the negotiations by the US, as Caracas had at the time broken off diplomatic relations with Britain. The whole thing was a massive stitch up, their argument goes, part of the great rapprochement between Britain and the US in the late 19th century and therefore can be ignored. To give himself a bit of political wiggle room, Nicolas Maduro, Venezuela's president since 2013, asked five questions in the referendum, all of which were variations on the theme of sticking two fingers up to the 1889 settlement. Unsurprisingly, there was a massive yes vote in favour of a future digit-raising policy. 10 million out of a total electorate of only double that is a pretty impressive result. Except that each person answered five near identical questions, meaning the actual number who voted for the incorporation of Essequibo into the map of Venezuelan territory, which is a completely different prospect from an invasion, obviously, was only about two million. The low turnout allowed the government of Guyana to breathe a sigh of relief. But who cares? Certainly not Nicolas Maduro, who said the result has been a total success for our country, for our democracy. He then praised the very important level of participation and hailed the first steps of a new historic stage in the struggle for what belongs to us. Even he, though, after all the fireworks had been set off and the Cuba Libras drained, would know it hadn't been quite the overwhelming show of support he was after. So what are the chances of any military intervention? In a nutshell, Coco or otherwise, not a lot. Tensions are rising, however. Maduro has set up a temporary government for Essequibo and appointed Major General Alexis Cabello as sole authority over the region. A new map was presented to the Venezuelan public, showing Essequibo to be part of the country. Guyana's president responded by placing the country's limited military resources on high alert and has made his fears known to the UN Secretary General and the White House. Tonight, President Maduro announced several measures which his government intends to take in enforcing the outcome of the referendum held on December 3rd, 2023. We will not allow our territory to be violated, nor the development of our country to be stymied by this desperate threat. Yes, the Venezuelan armed forces dwarf anything Guyana could put in the field. A regular army of over 60,000, including Russian-supplied tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, which regardless of the weaknesses highlighted in Ukraine can still pack a punch. Nearly 12,000 in an air force operating Russian and American fighters, including F-16s. And 25,000 in the Navy, equipped with submarines, frigates and amphibious landing craft, 
handy for securing oil fields, especially as the Guyanese Navy numbers only five ships, although one, bought 20 years ago, was the former Royal Navy mine hunter HMS Orwell. Now the Venezuelan Navy hasn't seen much action, although as naval analyst H. Sutton says, it did score a notable maritime kill in March 2020. Unfortunately, it was one of its own boats. Back then, an 80 meter long patrol boat got too close to the ice-hardened expedition cruise ship and general penguin botherer, the RCGS Resolute. After a little bump, the Venezuelan ship promptly sank, much to Maduro's annoyance. He accused the captain of the cruise ship of piracy, adding, for good measure, that he hadn't ruled out the possibility the aging tourists on board were actually mercenaries planning to attack shore-based military facilities. In 2023, however, Venezuela received at least four PECAP-3 class missile boats from Iran, armed with anti-ship missiles and torpedoes. H. Sutton says these boats do represent a significant threat to merchant ships and any Guyanese government vessels. The mismanagement of Venezuela's economy by Nicolas Maduro and before him Hugo Chavez has affected equipment serviceability and training levels, especially in the Air Force. Even so, and accepting the lessons from Ukraine that size and strength on paper don't always equate to military capability, if push comes to shove, Guyana will probably come second in any dust-up. It's unlikely to get that far though, on account of the few hundred US Marines located at the embassy in Guyana's capital, Georgetown, and the few thousand more that occasionally float past on naval exercises in the region. Plus, if Maduro made any serious noises about launching a military attack, an act that would ride roughshod over at least two international treaties, the sanctions that were partially lifted by the US only in October in a bid to encourage free and fair presidential elections next year would be rapidly reapplied. And that would be just the start. So all a lot of bluster and hot air then. Well, there may be another angle to the whole thing. Back in 2019, Reuters reported mercenaries from Russia's Wagner Group, led by notorious thug and failed Icarus impersonator Yevgeny Prigozhin, were in Caracas as personal bodyguards of President Maduro. Around 400 fighters were thought to have traveled there via Cuba for the 2018 presidential election, during which time a number of protests had broken out on the rare occasions Maduro had left his heavily defended office to meet his adoring citizens. Russia and Venezuela have close ties, which extend to today, in financial loans and military support, to name just two areas. But there's one more part of the relationship that may be even more important to Maduro. After Prigozhin's failed advance on Moscow in June this year, or mutiny, no bounty, Maduro praised Putin for his handling of the coup. The Wagner Group has also trained elite Venezuelan combat units and participated in training pro-Maduro militias alongside Colombian guerrillas. Despite that little falling out on the road to Moscow and the, you know, plane accident, Wagner fighters are thought to still be in Venezuela, protecting oil refineries and providing personal security for Russian commercial entities, including units of Rosneft, the Russian state oil giant. Payment for these services might be in thorium and perhaps gold extracted from mines in the country, a typical Wagner payment method. Wagner, of course, is known to be an extension of Russian political and influence activities as much as muscle. It's not too big a leap to wonder if the recent spat with Guyana has been encouraged by Wagner, i.e. the Kremlin, or their presence has at least emboldened Maduro to act so bullishly. He has, after all, somewhat painted himself into a corner. Venezuela, according to oil giant BP, has more reserves of the black gold than any other country on the planet. So Maduro doesn't really need to make a play for the stuff next door. But now, having made a right old song and dance about the referendum, Maduro must either see through his promise to grab Essequibo, with all the chaos that will bring, or back down and invite ridicule ahead of presidential elections next year. So why has he done it? What's in it for him? Maybe he wasn't the instigator of this crisis. Maybe some other actor has encouraged, cajoled or forced Maduro to act in the way he has, to divert international attention and test yet again the world's appetite for standing up to bullies who care nothing for sovereignty and instead like to redraw international boundaries by force. Where would we find such a fellow who might fit that mugshot? Defence In Depth is a weekly video output by The Telegraph of the big defence stories. 
do join us again next week for the last episode of 2023. If you'd like a daily fix of content about the war in Ukraine, I'd suggest Ukraine the Latest, the Telegraph's podcast. Please do visit our website for the latest updates, news and analysis, or failing that, you could buy the paper. <laughs>